Welcome to another Down Under in Oz edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 450. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm David Old in Parramatta, New South Wales, Australia. It is the morning of Tuesday, the 23rd of October, 2018. Okay, welcome to our forward and back in time edition. I get to talk to the future. And uh, I just had David pray for the show in the future covering us today. That's kind of fun to do. David, how are you doing down under? Oh, look, we're good. And Kevin, we're encouraged. This last weekend has seen uh, some more diocesan synods across, um, across Australia, in particular the Metropolitan Diocese of Melbourne and Adelaide, and in both those dioceses, uh, motions for blessings of same-sex marriages, uh, both uh, were fell down, basically. Okay, yeah, and they come up from time to time in the synods. Uh, sometimes they're trying to sneak them through. Sometimes you know well in advance that uh, this is on the agenda and exactly what it says. This is one of those that was kind of on the agenda, you know, to begin with, and they yes. uh, couldn't get it through. The votes just weren't there for them. But in all fairness, there are places in Australia, if this came up, the laity would vote for it. Yes, absolutely. So um, the place where it has passed, uh, uh, we've already documented, is the Diocese of Wangaratta. The Bishop John Parks has been unequivocal in his support of blessing of same-sex marriages. And then what you've had is throughout, the as the synods have happened, uh, and they usually happen here in the spring in Australia, which is your autumn, your fall, mm -hmm. um, in diocese after diocese, you've seen essentially the same wording of the motion. It's clearly a coordinated campaign. It recognizes the vote in Wangaratta. That's, uh, I assume, politically to try and get some momentum up and then it calls for blessings of same-sex marriages that have been contracted uh, in civil marriages so um, let me just remind your viewers uh, here in Australia we now have um, a civil same-sex marriage and uh, denominations can choose to marry if they want to the Anglican Church has said a very clear no in many different ways so there's plenty of Anglicans around the country who have been married in same-sex marriages and now want a blessing uh, those motions keep falling uh, in dioceses all around the country the same motion has been put up pretty much the same motion everywhere and um, we're keeping it well what we're actually seeing is motions not being put so we get to a point in the debate where the conservatives now are getting very good at arguing look um, this is contentious we already have a process in place in the national church to consider this uh, further politically it's not going to be very helpful uh, let's not put this motion let's um let's in fact let's just put it to bed and get 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 rid of it and that is happening in diocese after diocese, and particularly significantly this last weekend in the Melbourne diocese, the Archdeacon of Melbourne, Craig Dalton, an openly gay man uh, who says that he's uh, living celibately at the moment in accordance with the church's teaching. He put up this motion and a couple of others, and uh, it was uh, there was some debate. And then after three or four speeches, somebody said, look, let's not put this. And the Melbourne Synod said, yeah, we don't want to do this. And so they voted that it not be put. Now, I don't know how much uh, attention you guys pay to the mother church. But uh, over in England, they're discussing a new report to come out in 2020 called the Living Love yes. and Faith uh, um, Document. And uh, some yes. people have had some privy to it, and uh, they're coming away pretty scared. Um, have you guys heard about this at all? Yeah, so um, what appears to be going on in England, and Gavin and Peter, I'm sure, can give you more details. There appears to be a block of... Um, conservative bishops, at least more conservative than, uh, than than others in the House of Bishops, who are caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, we've seen in the past week a letter sent to uh, the, uh, the, the report writers saying, look, do you know what, if you go soft on this, um, well, I think it's actually basically a threat to leave. They've been pretty was, clear think, yeah. on what the line is. And yet at the same time, in the last couple of days, uh, many of those bishops, uh, always concentric uh, circles of bishops, not quite identical, uh, wrote to GAFCON in response to GAFCON's letter to the churches from the um, from the Jerusalem conference that you and I were at. And they basically said, look, we we're, 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 uh, have lots of agreement, but we're having a fundamental problem with uh, one clause in particular, the Jerusalem Declaration, that says we repudiate false teaching uh how do you even know who those false teachers are besides we've got our own bases of orthodoxy now i reached out i published a piece yesterday i reached out to a couple of the authors signatories on that letter uh and uh i got some responses which i've documented in my in in my piece but essentially uh 
they think that to, it's a precipitative of GAFCON. GAFCON is moving too quickly. Besides, why would you ask a bishop to sign an extra statement of faith when they already have a clear one in the Church of England? I think the counter argument uh, to that would probably be uh, statements of faith don't count for anything if the body itself won't uphold the statement of faith. Now, I've also reached out to people in the GAFCON uh, hierarchy uh, for comment, and I've been told there will be comment, uh, but it's not going to be immediate. It's going to be in a, in a, in a few weeks' time. Uh, so I think we should keep our eyes open for how GAFCON respond to that. I wonder what it's going to be. I wonder if it's going to be, a, as we here in Australia or back in England would say, if it's going to be a straight back, that is just, just donk it back and say, not having that. Or I wonder if it will be something conciliatory that says, look, we're going to try and work with you. We're going to try and bring you within the fold. Kevin, my suspicion is knowing some of the bishops that signed that letter, I don't think they're going to be satisfied with um, anything other than not having to uh, agree to that declaration. And I think the problem with that clause is it goes to the fundamental nature of the disagreement. Uh, do you break from false teachers before the denomination itself breaks as a whole? Or has, yeah, and I mean, which came first, the chicken or the egg? It is, it is that I'm essential just, argument. Uh, I know some yes. people in uh, the Church of England and around the world, there's bishops who say, you know, those, those uh, GAFCON people, those ACNA people, they're, they're schismatics. Uh, yes, I know this is yes. what Justin Welby thinks of GAFCON, and this is what Justin Welby yeah. thinks of the ACNA. He thinks they're being schismatic. Um, and he, yeah. he, said, <laughs> he, he said as much to some archbishops. Well, Ken, I think the problem is, as you say, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I think the problem now is we've just got scrambled egg on the plate. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, uh, it's, it's, yeah, we can argue about which comes first. I think the reality is there. I think, I still think I'm one of those that thinks it's a little bit naive. I don't want to use that word in a pejorative sense. I think it's a little bit naive of of those who say, look, we, we're not that far yet. Uh, even just things that happen every day. Two bishops were just pictured at the, at the um at a gay award ceremony in um, in London in the last couple of days. So the Bishop of Manchester, well known, and of course uh, our old friend Alan Wilson, uh, suffragan Bishop of Buckingham. Um, again, th there's bishops openly, openly standing in rejection of the Church of England's doctrine on marriage, and and Gafcon supporters and others just see that and just go, look, what is going on? What is going on here? And why is not nothing clearer being done about it? And of course, uh, I think uh, that, we've given up looking to Welby, haven't we? We've given up looking to Welby, and now we're looking to individual leaders to yeah. to take a stand. And that's the big thing. There's just no accountability anywhere. Uh, the only accountability you ever see is within Gafcon or within the ACNA. I don't see accountability in t the Episcopal Church. Certainly not in the Church of England. Uh, the last time that a person was accountable in the Church of England, they ended up uh, burnt at the stake. Well, yeah. that's true. And, and, and almost I want to go, we might as well have Rowan Williams back. I think yeah. it would be less disappointing. It would be less <laughs> disappointing. We would have a guy who claimed to be an evangelical uh, uh, making such constant conciliatory noises. I, I, listen, Harry and Meghan, Harry and Meghan are here. Yes, on a they royal are. Tour. Really? And I haven't the seen the Australian press talk about that at all. <laughs> All the Republicans, all the Republicans are, are are not happy. That's okay. That's their problem. But here's the thing: I, I, all this done is remind me of that just the travesty of of um of, of the um, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church being invited to that to preach at that wedding last year. I think that that's still. I think we've seen that was. I think more and more that was just before Gafcon, wasn't it? Uh, but more yeah. and more we're just yeah. we're just seeing that was that was the moment where we just went. Welby has no intention of being clear on this subject. He took a red hot poker out of the fireplace and tried to stab Gafcon. And, uh, you know, that's exactly what that was with the wedding. And, you know, we'll have to see what it means long term. But uh, there are still people, not a lot, but there's leadership within Gafcon that still has some trust for Welby. I have none. Uh, I don't know what it's like down in Australia, but um, he's, he's burning bridges left and right, uh, except for his secular political bridges within England. Well, I think the guys here still want to play nice. Um, I, I've not spoken to our Archbishop here uh, about these things for a long, long time, but I know he is a diplomat and uh, it's, his, it's his very nature to want to make things work. You saw that recently in the way that he uh, went over to New Zealand and spoke to the House of Bishops there about their, um, the people there that had to leave. And he talked to them about, let's find a way forward. Let's try and see if we can build up bonds of trust. Still no answer from the New Zealand guys um, on that. And so uh, the parishes that have left are starting to form their own unit. Uh, but he tries. He tries to his credit. He tries. Uh, whether that will be good enough. 
um, we'll see. I, I get the sense Welby is going down one road now. Uh, and, um, and it's always the way. You can't keep everybody happy. Uh, but um, he, he is trying, isn't he? Okay. People are going to be asking me. I, I know the first comments are, why is he wearing a vest? What's with? It, it, are they reshooting Godfather Four down in in Oz? Is, is he an extra? What, what's going on? Why the vest so and first, purple tie? <laughs> Kevin, listen. So first of all, this is not a vest. This is a long coat. A vest is what my grandpa wears under his shirt <laughs> to keep him warm in the winter. This uh -huh. is a this is a waistcoat. Um, I, I'm just getting into waistcoats at the moment. I think I wore one last time that we were recording. Uh, it's it's heading rapidly into the summer here. Um, I like. I enjoy quite just dressing up a little bit, and I think a, a waistcoat and a tie is just a nice way to go. Uh, so this is what I'm wearing today. I'm actually wearing a pair of jeans down on the bottom half, uh, that kind of uh, nice casual look that I picked up in Italy uh, when I was there uh, uh, a few months ago. I've got a, an Italian barista down the road who does me my coffee, and he says I look like a, a signora now, which I sure. think is Italian gentleman. So um, okay. I'll take that from him. And your, so, your readers, look, I'm more than happy for your readers to pass comment on anything at all. If they want to give me sartorial <laughs> assistance, we're still waiting for some of them to, to update oh, yeah. my, my podcasting studio. Uh, we're happy, Kevin, to take all the comments we want. We're, we're, I'm, I'm suitably confident in myself enough to take <laughs> That's it. good. Your style is great. Clearly, we use the same hairdresser. Uh, people appreciate yes, all that type of stuff. Now, uh, we need to let people know that you have a new... Road microphone on the way. You're going to be as professional as everybody else at Anglican Unscripted. Well, I well I hope so. So I put out a little uh, um, a little uh, request on on some social media stuff for people to point me towards the best microphones after we talked last time. And uh, somebody very kind. I'm not going to name them to embarrass them, but somebody very kind said, "Look, I've got a quite a, uh, a swanky little microphone uh, for podcasting stuff that we never use. What do you want to use it for?" I told him, and he said, oh, "That's good. I'm going to send it to you." So he's about to move house. When he moves house and finds the box it's in, he's promised to send it to me. In the meantime, I'm I'm thinking of just buying a couple of extra things as well. I've even turned. Kevin, I've turned my whole office around just for you. I did. In the background, sorry. you can see the plant. There it is, and uh, we'll get this. We'll get this looking nice. Actually, on this side, Kevin is. Um, can you see that? It's called a Mister Meaner in America to steal a uh, sign. Well, well, you might think that. You might think that. I studied uh, at the University of Illinois many, many years ago. And <laughs> what? Uh, when uh, were you in Illinois? <laughs> Uh, 1993 to 1994. Oh that's actually where I got converted um, from from being a church goer in the Church of England to actually uh, loving and trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm, I love my American friends. Uh, uh, that much. And so part of this conversion was to go up to a pole and steal a sign. Look, I don't remember. I don't remember the exact details of it. All I remember is that when I arrived back in England, somehow this sign had 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 arrived uh, with me in my baggage and um, I was uh, a young man of, of 19, 20 years old and uh, at that point I decided uh, res the responsible thing to do would be to, to see if I could return it. Unfortunately where I live in the north of England there's no American uh, consulate so it was very hard for me to do it and uh, it just keeps turning up in every box that I unpack every time I move house. Well, it's cool because it, every, everybody I run into has a different conversion story. Yours yes. takes takes the cake. That's conversion story number one. <laughs> well, it's there for my American friends just to say I, I love you all. I, I owe America a great a great debt, um, and um, and and that's my that's my current way of expressing it. I'll try and find other ways in the future. I'm Kevin Carlson, and I'm David Old, <laughs> and you've been watching episode four hundred and fifty of Anglican No Parking Unscripted. The Felony Edition. <laughs>